Mass Violence Prevention and Community Safety. We'll now come to order. Clerk, call the roll. Darby. Here. Navarez. Here. Blanco. Here. Capriglione. Here. Garen. Here. Irvin Hawkins. Here. Johnson. Here. Landgraf. Here. Lang. Here. Moody. Here. Morrison. Price. Wally. Here. Former President. Members, thank you all for traveling here on short notice for the first hearing. I appreciate your commitment to this meaningful, sensitive, and significant select committee. Thanks to staff and all invited guests for your participation. I want to thank Governor Abbott for his quick and comprehensive response to the recent incidents of violence and his executive orders to address some of our system shortcomings. This select committee will take guidance from the governor's strategies laid out in the Texas Safety Action Report. Members, that report is included in your drop box. I also want to thank Speaker Bonner for appointing the select committee so that the Texas House of Representatives can study and recommend new ways to prevent mass violence and reinforce public safety in Texas. In the wake of the recent shootings in El Paso and then in Midland, Odessa, it goes without saying the Texans are hurting. We've lost friends, family members, and co-workers from these acts of mass violence. And I say we because these tragedies and this loss of precious life are felt by everyone in our state, whether or not you knew the victims personally. Texans deserve better, and they expect and demand our earnest work to deliver sensible solutions. While we cannot at this time pass specific legislation, my hope is that this select committee can develop worthwhile recommendations for combating mass violence and improving public safety in our state. My commitment to you is that we will listen, we will work, and we will engage in a serious conversation about these important matters. As this committee travels the state to seek public input, I ask that you help me facilitate productive and constructive conversations to generate practical policy solutions that make sense for Texas. travels the state and seeks public input, I ask that you help me facilitate productive and constructive conversations to generate practical policy solutions that make sense for Texas. That being said, I want to make very clear that anyone who wishes to participate in these conversations be respectful of the opinions of others and be mindful of the emotional nature of these topics. Grandstanding Misrepresentations, harassment, intimidation, and threats will not be tolerated, period. I will have no hesitation to remove bad actors from this process. We have to work, we have work to do, and we want to honor that important work by acting with sincerity and respect to all stakeholders. Members of this committee will have a robust schedule over the interim. In addition to hearings in Austin, the committee plans to travel and hold public field hearings in Amarillo, Dallas-Fort Worth, El Paso, Houston, and Odessa. We may add other trips as needed. I will announce those dates and specific subject matter for each hearing in accordance with the House rules. During each field hearing, we will start with invited testimony and then take public testimony. My staff will work with you to ensure that we have all the information that you need for each hearing. The speaker's proclamation requires this committee to submit a preliminary assessment within 90 days of the committee's creation, which is December 4, 2019. 
A few housekeeping items before we begin. For today's hearing, the committee will only take invited testimony. In all hearings, we will observe the, text, the house rules on decorum, and as I said, I ask that you respect those testifying, and, will, and I will not tolerate outbursts or disruptions of any kind. We have overflow, overflow rooms available in E2012, E2016, so I ask folks, please do not stand in the back of the room. Members, do you have any questions, or, or would anyone like to make opening remarks be before we move to invited testimony? Chair recognizes uh, Chairwoman Morrison as present. Members, any anyone have any comments? Okay. Okay. At this time, Chair calls Colonel Stephen McCraw, Director, Texas Department of Public Safety, and Skylar Hearn. Deputy Director, Texas Department of Public Safety. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Vice Chairman, honorable members, uh, my name is Steve McCrom, Director of Texas Department of Public Safety. As you know and eloquently noted, uh, Chairman, that uh, there are some crimes that have a lasting and chilling impact on on the people of Texas and in fact the people anywhere and that's the mass killing of individuals and we saw it in Odessa tragically we saw it in El Paso tragically we also saw it in Santa Fe and we know from a Texas standpoint over the last 12 years or the last 53 years we've had 12 mass casualty attacks and six of those attacks have happened within the last three years killing 82 people, or over half the people have been killed over the last 53 years in mass casualty attacks. As you're aware, Governor Greg Abbott issued eight executive orders to move from reaction to prevention, and he's directed that the Department of Public Safety take specific actions, and if, with your permission, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll go through all eight of those. Absolutely. Okay? Right, sir. Uh, first and foremost, uh, well, I want to say foremost because all of them are very important in terms of prevention, and that's the operative word, prevention. Uh, is, is the ability to, the Department of Public Safety needs to work with and collaborate with local law enforcement to develop what, what questions, or what identifying data needs to be asked by, by individuals, whether they're law enforcement officers or whether they're communication specialists, that, that be able to, and be able to enter into a suspicious activity uh, response network. And of course, those things we're working on right now. There's very different models. You'll get the FBI version, Secret Service. Certainly, we have information. Bottom line, we're talking about who, what, when, where, why, and how, and the identifying information that you need to be able to follow up on that, both from the witness that is reporting the information, if you can get that information, also certainly the individual that there's suspicious activity being reported about. And when I talk about suspicious activity report, since we will move into it in the second area, is what are those standards? What are the legal standards? On well, Texas, uh, the 82nd legislative, uh, as you remember, the 82nd legislature passed legislation specifically regarding fusion centers. And of course, we adopted at that point in time, based upon rules, the, uh, the Department of Homeland Security Information Sharing Environment Standards for Suspicious Activity Report that meets the Department of Justice strict guidelines as it relates to what is suspicious activity report. And suspicious activity and defined in that area is very simply put, it's, it's that, those activities, observable activities, okay, that reasonably indicate that something is occurring that might uh, uh, pre uh, forewarn a, uh, a, either a terrorist event or a criminal, a criminal event. Either, either one of those, crime or terrorism. Either one of those falls within that standards. And of course, we adopt that. And as you're well aware of, we have the, uh, the iWatch system, and it's basically part of the Texas Suspicious Activity Reporting Network uh, that the fusion centers use in Texas. We don't have separate systems in each fusion center. We have one system in Texas. We have an enterprise license, so we're all using that same system. So it's the same interface. It doesn't matter whether you're an analyst up in uh, Dallas. If you're one in El Paso and San Antonio, you've got the same tool. More importantly, as, as we've learned over the years, is that there's so many di disparate databases and so many different agencies looking at so much different. And we even see that in schools in terms of different districts where there's data that's not reported or maybe reported one, but it's, you can't connect it to a, a district in another district or a school. And how do you be able to capture that observable okay, behavior 
that's, that's reasonably indicative of something that's op a pre-operational activity. And of course, that's the whole idea of having Texas, you know, iWatch program. is have one system, and the system we adopted uh, is, enables us to identify threat patterns, whether they're it's a threat to life or it's a particular crime, and identify those patterns and support uh, certainly our operations. Uh, the, uh, the third requirement is that once we've done those two things, is work with Texas uh, TCOL has a lead on this in terms of developing uh, training standards of what, of what uh, uh, law enforcement agencies and, and other in, in individuals in law enforcement agencies should report on suspicious activity reports. We've also, uh, the department was, was, uh, was uh, also tasked with what can we do to increase the public's awareness of these? What are those pre-attack indicators? Identify those and educate the public so when they see those things, that they report those things in a timely manner. And that's vitally important when we're talking about threats of life. So we, brought, we have we produced two videos right now that are, that are designed for schools, and we're going to, based on that, we're going to adapt those and expand that for the rest of the public as well. Number five, uh, the Department of Public Safety will work with Texas Education Agency. We're doing that right now. We're having a meeting that's ongoing at this moment. And it goes into working with TEA and how we can, can, they can capture that suspicious activity reports and knowing, knowing what the, the HIPAA requirements, some of this is restrictive data, how we, we can work together to be able to get that information in a timely manner. Number six, Department of Public Safety will work with local law enforcement, mental health professionals, school districts to create multidisciplinary threat teams. What that is, is that, and right now, if you talk to our, our FBI colleagues, by the way, and in DPS, we plussed up our special agents on the Joint Terrorism Task Force. There's a high volume, a significant volume right now in terms of these threat to lives. And as you know, every one has to be followed up on. You can't take anything for granted. You have to assume that, that something needs to be done. And you, know, make to, and you have to ensure that local law enforcement is aware of those things. And if it's in a school, that school administrators are aware of those things. So having a process in place to be able to do that is important, but also having the capability to do that. And we talk about multidisciplinary. We've already assigned four special agents in each of the, uh, the four locations throughout the state. So we've got four teams, and they mirror where all the joint terrorism, main joint terrorism task forces are with the FBI. And uh, San Antonio, El Paso, Dallas, and Houston is where they're located at right now. We can expand that. And we'll have an analyst and a psychiatrist on each of these teams. Right now, we just have special agents on these teams. And they're specifically there to follow up on threat to life leads as we get them. The, the seventh order is that uh, we're going to increase our staff at fusion centers for the purpose of better collecting and responding to suspicious activity reports. One of the things that we have not been doing, and, uh, and, it's, and some of that is because some of the tools have, have, been, have been disappearing over the years is because of concerns about privacy is proactively looking for threats. And then we know, for example, the El Paso shooter was, was involved in and visited over the internet certain forms and had studied the replacement theory that was espoused by the, that individual that, uh, that, uh, that killed so many people in Moss in Christchurch in New Zealand. And we know that by, by, by if we can proactively find those individuals before an event we have a better chance of being an opportunity to prevent such an attack. So how can we do that? And well, it, it takes people around the clock to do it. It takes professional analysts around the clock to do it. They have to have some skills, obviously some very good skills as it relates to internet. They, have, they didn't need to know what 4chan is, 8chan. They know how to inter integrate into those things. Have open accounts and, and observe that type of behavior because again, once they see it, if, it's, if it, the behavior itself is a reasonably indicative of, of, of a potential threat, then they've got an obligation, we'll generate a suspicious activity report into a Texas iWatch system. And if we put something in iWatch, we, then it needs to be followed up on. And again, so agents throughout the, the, the state will be following up on that. Other fusion centers as well. Uh, this is something that the, the governor's looking at staffing, of course, uh, you know, up staffing. And uh, we've met with their office and, uh, and they're, they're they want to be as proactive as possible in terms of addressing the online forums for potential threats. Number, number eight deals with the, uh, the, uh, the reporting system. I know that, uh, Speaker Moody, we had a discussion a little bit about that before this meeting, and I'm going to defer to uh, Colonel Hearn to uh, discuss what we're doing right now. 
Good morning, Scott O'Hearn, uh, Deputy Director of DPS. Uh, with regards to upgrading uh, the system we have, we have two priorities going out right now. Scott, let, yes. let me jump in. Of course, I was participating in the 82nd session, as I think some of the members up here on the panel. But let's go back to a more fundamental uh, issue as, as to these fusion centers. Uh, it seems to be it's a creation of Homeland Security, and we are simply creating these facilities here in Texas. Is this pursuant to a obviously a national effort on behalf of Homeland Security and the federal government to fund these? Uh, I, I guess the question is, how were they originated? Obviously, we had enabling legislation mm -hmm. in the 82nd, but how are they funded? Who pays for these? How do they decide where they are located? What are their functions? Yes, sir. How are they staffed? Who pays for the staff? I know those are all rudimentary questions, but they're important, mm -hmm. certainly from my standpoint, is to so that we can understand what these centers do. And when you when you talk about um, risk assessment, and you mentioned it, issues of privacy, mm -hmm. uh, constitutional rights, due process, all of that comes to mind. And so I need to, and I think the committee also needs to understand uh, these fusion centers, what was the basis for them to come into existence? What have we done to create them? How do they, how do we fund them? How do we staff them? How do we, you know, if we're, we're tasking them with additional responsibilities, who's going to pay for that? Mm -hmm. I mean, how is that to be done? So, and again, I don't want to interrupt your train of thought, but at some point in this process today, I want to start understanding more fully, uh, uh, this fusion center process. Yes, sir. Well, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm. And Vice Chair Navarro has a question Ms. also. Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind, do you mind if I I ask uh, Colonel McCraw a couple of questions before we? Absolutely, to, uh, absolutely. And Colonel members, Hunt. anytime you have a question, feel free to uh, get my attention and ask the question. And because uh, these yeah. these are our only two invited. Uh, experts here so uh, feel free to ask them questions as they come to you uh, it's good to see you again colonel mccraw yes sir chairman uh, although under these circumstances it's a little bit uh, odd or off-putting i would say but uh, you mentioned towards the end of your your testimony you were talking about some of these groups and these um, websites i think it was eight channel and four channel yes, sir. Uh, can you tell the committee to the extent that you can because i know some of it you you can't what how much these orders or anything else that you're doing will help to track some of these groups that are on these websites and the information that's filtering through mm -hmm. to identify threats into the future and what groups are you prepared to talk about that are actively working here in Texas or using these websites here in Texas to either you know cultivate whatever it is they're trying to do or uh, radicalize if you will some of the people here in the state or spread some of these messages like the manifesto that was Mm -hmm. uh, used or followed in the shooting in El Paso. Can you talk about that to the extent that you can? Yes, sir. Well, well, first, the most significant threat right now is a self-radicalized lone actor using available weapons against soft targets. That's number one. And so we say self-radicalized, it goes to the propaganda. And the propaganda has proliferated throughout the Internet world. And, of course, some of that is racially based, okay, neo-Nazis, Christian identity. Uh, some of it is, you know, the replacement that I talked about is really the replacement is, is a, a theory about uh, Muslims replacing, uh, Muslims from uh, African countries replacing Anglos, okay, uh, Christian Anglos in countries, in other countries in Europe. And, of course, New Zealand, he took it to New Zealand. And, of course, the, the mass shooter in, uh, in El Paso took that theory and applied it to Hispanics. So it's racially motivated domestic terrorism is what we have. Uh, it, when you can have it, it's, uh, so that's, you can have it both ways in that regard. There's anti-government, okay, also along those lines. So it's a, the, there's no limit in terms of what the, is out there. Uh, some of the constraints that we have is free speech, obviously. People have a right to speak and say what they want to. But we also have a right to be able to observe, okay, the, that activity that is in the, in the public. That's and, and, Colonel, let me interrupt you right yes, there sir. because I think that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, uh, is when you're talking about, and that's really what, you know, the, the needle or what we have to thread right here, which is 
the ability to observe and be able to detect or prevent, as you were talking about before, some of these things because we've got eyes and ears on the ground. And so to Chairman Darby's point, to you, Scholar, but I'll ask you, Colonel, regarding uh, budgetary constraints, or in this case, you know, hopefully there, there won't be any, but under the parameters that we have now, would you agree that the jump that you need to make now to get more active or more proactive, if you will, in this arena financially is a big one? Would you agree? Well, I would agree that uh, that we've, we've cost out what the, the, the analytical resources and agent resources would be to uh, at, as a baseline, and it was it'd be a significant amount, yes, sir. And so it, it's it's a it's time that we had some more resources that were heading that way because you would agree you're probably not on par with what the FBI can do currently in terms of that observation that you just mentioned. Well, we want to make sure that we're okay. Everything we do is with the FBI. The last thing we can do is 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 duplicate work in that regard, and we integrate. That's why we plussed up our special agents on the Joint Terrorism Task Forces. I can't say this, you know, back to the money thing, is that we realize that, yes, we, there's limited resources, but I mean, the government directed it right now. So what we've done is we've taken resources that we're doing X and they're now doing Y because that's an important, like anything else. You've got limited resources, you've got to prioritize, and that's what we're doing right now. So whether it's special agents and or our analysts uh, when are in a threat assessment and monitoring section within the Fusion Center here in Austin, we're diverting them from other activities is what we're doing so we can have 24 and 7 coverage on threat activities, but also monitoring activities. And, and again, without, I, I, not, I don't want to see your whole cards on this. I don't think anybody yes. on the committee wants to see them right now because we, we shouldn't. But uh, am I correct in, in, in stating that there are groups and individuals currently right now that you all are aware of and that you all are monitoring, monitoring as, a, as a result of being on these websites and the traffic that you're seeing. Yes, sir, that's correct. Now, you mentioned the, the, the pro, you gave us kind of a profile of what we're dealing with, and that's the, I think you said loan self-radicalization, correct? Yes, sir. Over the internet, and then you gave us some criteria for what we're looking at, which is racially motivated, uh, Christian identity, and I think there were some other things. Now, when we're looking at the profile, there, there's also another part that, that we need to be looking at, and I think the committee's going to look at, and that's the ability of this person to actually arm themselves to carry through with whatever radicalization or ideas they're absorbing on the Internet or whatever propaganda they're getting. Would, would you agree with that? Yeah, I agree. Whatever, whatever, whatever weapons they choose. And, and frankly, it really, the motive, if they're mass killers, the motive and the means matters not because there's many other means, as you know, explosives, Certainly, uh, so, you know, biological, chemical agents, all those, th you know, and, and uh, vehicles have been used as well, and, 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 and sniper attacks is also, so. So, but currently what we're dealing with is what we have in front of us, yes, which sir. is, uh, again, the ability, whether it's arming themselves with some sort of explosive device or, or being able to create an explosive device, these are things, obviously, that, uh, and I, again, without knowing the criteria of the searches that you all use or the keywords that come up, I'm sure if somebody's, you know, Googling, you know, how to make, you know, some sort of explosive using fertilizer, you guys are going to, it should pop up somewhere if they're trying to get these uh, implements, correct? We're, yeah, we're using various different techniques to do that. I can tell you, though, because of privacy concerns, I mean, there's less data available for law enforcement these days because of those concerns, because of some comp social media companies have been selling the data. There's companies that are now limiting in terms of what they'll sell to law enforcement. So. <coughs> It's a little more challenging than it was, but it's, it's, again, those are just some of the things that we're facing. And, and I think just listening to your testimony, Colonel, is one of the things or one of the challenges that, that we have as a, as a body and I think as a committee is where these lines of privacy, where these lines or desires of limiting, uh, you know, what somebody might consider an intrusion on the Second Amendment, where these lines intersect so that we do the best that we can so that mm -hmm. these things don't happen. And I think that's kind of where, listening to your testimony, that, that's going to be the challenge in front of us. And I've got a lot more questions, sure. I think, but I'm going to I'm going to hand off because I think oh. other colleagues may have some oh. questions. Chairman Blanco. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thank you, Colonel. First of all, for uh, I've got to commend you and your department for the heroism that was displayed both in El Paso and Odessa. Uh, uh, the state should be proud. Of, of the department that you run and, and those troopers that are doing the work day in and day out. So 
Thank you for your service. Thank and, you, sir. And thank you for their heroism. Thank you, sir. Uh, along the lines of uh, uh, the vice chair's question, specific to um, social media and where a lot of these groups are, are being radicalized, and I know that you were part of the governor's roundtables where we convened yes, and sir. had uh, representatives from Google, Facebook, Twitter. Um, I, I'd like to know, it, it seems to me that um, these platforms should share uh, part of the uh, monitoring um, uh, programs to ensure that uh, this type of radicalization doesn't spread and I think it that, that's a shared uh, responsibility along with law enforcement um, obviously we want to uh, make sure that we're protecting the First Amendment uh, mm -hmm. at all times but what can you tell us as a result of those roundtables some of the things that law enforcement is doing in coordination with the social media platforms um, are there terms of use agreements? Are there um, uh, timelines to, to, to silence or mute um, an account that could be actively radicalizing? Has there been any movement since those? Or are you all in communications, I guess, between your fusion centers and uh, these social media platforms? Well, <clears throat> we're in discussion with them now. Uh, I can't, uh, I can tell you our biggest concern is that uh, I don't want to, it doesn't do us any good to get a report that there's a, an immediate, immediate or imminent threat, but not tell us who is against and who's, who's engaged in it. it. Just that there's a threat. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. The, the, the threat in Dallas, what, Houston? It's a big state. Right. And we need to know the, some specificity in terms of what that is, especially if it's an imminent threat. So we're going to work with these companies that they, because the, I think one thing that, uh, that uh, the panel, a couple of members on the panel had noted is that the companies do a very good job. I mean, the technology expertise is not in government, it's in the private sector. And to the extent that they can use, okay, search criteria to identify imminent threats and report that in a timely manner to law enforcement, we're going to be much better off. Mm -hmm. And so we hope to achieve that is the, the goal in that regard because we're talking some very good com big companies, as you know, you were participating in those discussions. Right. And, and on that, I mean, do we, and I think this is a question of the, uh, regarding the budget, um, do we, at the fusion centers, do you feel uh, that we have sufficient um, number of analysts that can, I mean, this is a lot of work, um, um, uh, intel gathering and, and, and information sharing requires uh, an immense amount of resources. Um, are, do you think that we're, we're there. Uh, do you think that uh, we're going to need to get there next next session with with uh, additional uh, funding? Well, I'm, I'm confident we're going to need more resources. Uh, you know, particularly analytical resources, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the skill set is higher than some of the skill sets we've had before. So we've, we're confident that we are going simply because we're going to create the demand ourselves mm -hmm. because we're going to be looking and probing along those lines, and we're educating a part of the executive order, educating law enforcement and working with TEA to, to have a single platform. So in each one of these leads that we talked about earlier is that every lead has to be followed up on. You can't, you know, you cannot sit on it. You have to in, in follow it to its logical conclusion. And so that will take, that will take certainly resources to do that. And there we got to use the resources that we have to be able to d address that. And to kind of bridge back to the chairman's question about well, where these fusion centers came from mm -hmm. is that uh, in the infancy of it, well, it, it really came as a result of the Homeland Security Act of, of 04 when it created Homeland Security and also created the agencies, but also there was a urban area uh, security initiative and also Homeland Security grant funds that flowed from the federal government to the states and to the major urban areas, okay, to fund things. And one of the things they authorized funding was fusion centers. And the point of fusion centers and the use of the term was is that it's cross-disciplinary, okay, suspicious activity. Because sometimes it might be you're concerned about a pandemic as, as much as you're concerned about, you know, a, a, a sniper. So it's, it's an ability to be able to get all suspicious activity collected based upon the information sharing environment standards in a way that it gets to the federal government as well and is vetted. And, of course, our system has, is... is linked to eGuardian, which is the FBI's is threat system in that regard. So it is, it, there's not du duplication, and we don't miss something. Something doesn't fall through the crack. Because it, be, it may be local, it may be state, but it may require an intelligence community, you know, knowledge of that particular piece of information to be able to get 
information back in that regard. So the, to, to your answer, you know, Chairman, it depends on the some cities have dedicated their own resources to it, and others have been able to use the resources from urban area security grants to get to analysts. All of them have, 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 have talked about needing more analysts, I can tell you that. And uh, in some instances, like Texas, what we did from a Department of Public Safety standpoint, we said, look, we've got, there's eight fusion centers in Texas. The governor gets to designate one as the state, the lead state fusion center. And he gave that to the Texas Fusion Center, which we have in the Department of Public Safety. And if you look at it, if, if intelligence is so important, okay, for the Department of Public Safety, it's better done in, in a, a shared environment than done strictly by ourselves. So we basically, our intelligence counterterrorism division, those resources are aligned in the fusion center. And that way we've got agencies that we participate with. We've got DEA, we've got EPIC, we've got FBI, we've got ICE, we've got Customs. We have all the, the alphabets in the federal agencies, okay, which is important to have, as you know, because of the different data databases that they have. So that's basically where and how these are funded. So we're basically using our state funds okay, to fund the Texas Fusion Center, recognizing that intelligence is vital to the state, and therefore, but it's, it, it's more vital, or it's better if we do it in a shared environment. So that's how Texas has done it. We've also looked at it a little bit different than other states. We looked at it as a shared network. So if we're entering data into Dallas, or the Collin County one, or if it's the El Paso one or San Antonio, it's going into the same location. The same place we have the, pop, uh, the opportunity to connect those things. Uh, Colonel, I think uh, Representative Quigley on. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. That's Chairman. Sure. Uh, thank you, Colonel, for being here. And, and I'll echo what others have said. Thank you for all the work and effort that your, your agency has done. Um, uh, my question is, uh, I, is more related to if you could share with us what the process is today for your agency or any law enforcement agency in Texas to. Um, go to a court, right, and say, hey, we want, we need more additional information. We need maybe access to this person's account or need access to their searches and how that works and whether you feel that there's enough, I guess, um, I would say skill or training on, on how to do that. The reason I ask is because I was talking to one law enforcement agency, not DPS, but last week, and they had told me uh, that sometimes they'll go through, they'll get a court order and sometimes the social media companies either are non-responsive or, res or respond even with a court order uh, late. So if there's some way you can explain that, you know, how quickly this, this process goes where you're like, hey, we, we, we have a court order, we want to get a court order, we need this person's information, we need this person's precise location, mm -hmm. and how that works with the bigger social media companies. Well, it depends on the company and the instance, but obviously, begins with a court order. So you've got a judicial process. And a court order, you know, whether it's a subpoena or whether it's a court order or a search warrant in some instances, are required, although, or depending on what the circumstances are. So we train our special agents very much so, and our Texas Rangers are very trained, and troopers are trained on what prob re probable cause is and how to write an affidavit for a warrant. And then a judge reviews that at that process, and then you serve it. And to your point is there may be companies that are, that are less timely than other companies, and that's, you know, our job to work with them as, 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 and, and to, to the extent that we can get them to, to help us, you know, uh, protect our citizens is, is vitally important. I can say that, you know, that everything moves. And this is, everyone is concerned about privacy. I mean, no one wants, you know, the governor, uh, governor, government in, in Texas or any government, the federal government, prying around in their digital data. We just don't want it, plain and simple, unless there's a reason for it. And that reason is based upon our judicial system, and there's probable cause, and there's a, and there's a search warrant, there's a, either a subpoena or a court order or a search warrant to be able to get that particular data. And that's the, the standard that we certainly we use. And again, I'll go back to and the, the point is, is that there's been a reluctance to share information with law enforcement recently. I'd say over the last, there's been a, it's, it, it, it ebbs and flows. I think unfortunately, tragically, because of these, these murders, these, these killings that are happening right now that, that are increasing, and it, not just in Texas, but in Dayton, Ohio, and California, and in, in, in Florida. As a result of those things, I think we're getting, they're, they're willing to, I think there is a willingness to work closer with law enforcement. Now, like anything else, proof is in the, whether you do it or not. Right. And, I, and we'll, we, will, we shall see. Right, so you're not there yet, though. 
We're not, we're not there. I'm not convinced we're there yet. Absolutely. Thank you. Representative Lang. Colonel, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, that covered part of my question, um, being concerned with the First Amendment, of course, the Fourth Amendment, uh, which you covered. As far as a fusion center, um, some of that is public information um, that you would garner. Now, let's say a report came in on, on social media, uh, <coughs> open public social media. It went to the fusion center about a school shooting. How would you get that from the fusion center to where you need it? How would you implement we wanted, I'll go back to the, uh, for the DPS process. Let's say it came in, uh, we would fill out a suspicious activity report at the same time, enter it to our SPURS database, the state police, like it's a unified state police operation or database that we have, our, our record management system within DPS, and set a lead out, okay? So we're tracking it at that point in time and making that phone call. I'll use an example. We've got a, an instance where a, uh, someone in the UK was watching YouTube and they saw a threat, and they reported it to the FBI's National Threat Operations Center in Washington, D.C. They reported it to the Texas Fusion Center, who did that immediately, okay, while they're doing that, calling downrange, and the downrange person best able to handle that was a Texas Ranger with a local police officer in Brownsville to follow up on that threat. And this way we've got a, a documented trail, plus if it didn't rise to a level, and even if it did rise, you had that underlining activity that was documented because it was observable, observable. it was uh, reasonably indicative of a criminal or, or pre-criminal or pre-terrorism type of activity, so we can keep that data in that regard. So if something else happens down the road, you know, now the action was taken. Now whether that action takes, meaning whether, whether that, that, you know, that's to be seen like anything else, but at least we've, got, we've documented that, and if other activity happens, we're able to put those dots together. From re uh, reasonable suspicion to like a probable cause. Yes, sir. Where you move up the scale. Correct. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. There was a... Oh, Chair Moody. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> thank you all very much. I, I wanted to um, wanted to focus in on, on on number eight, but before that, just look at the the governor's directive, at least in the initial executive orders. I know he had subsequent executive orders in in the following document that was released last week. But the goal was to stop violent criminals before they commit mass murders. Now that is, as, as you've explained, a very complicated process. Um, digging into the who and, and the how, uh, and what can we do to disrupt that along the path. Um, and also in his statement said that he would expeditiously work with us. And I'm, I'm grateful that we're here and actually have a timeline on the work that we're doing, because I think that's important. Um, to get the hands out, uh, get the guns out of the hands of dangerous criminals, while also safeguarding the Second Amendment. So I see what our goal is to prevent and, and marshal our resources to do that, with with an aim of of keeping firearms out of hands of people that mm -hmm. shouldn't have them. Now to the to, to that point, um, I think it's important to dig into Order Number Eight because we're talking about uh, the rate at which law enforcement entities are reporting to CGIS mm -hmm. convictions. And so the, the, directive, the directive is to make sure that all future grant awards aren't going to anyone who's not reporting these convictions at 90% clip within seven days of the conviction being had. Is that, that, is that correct? Yes, sir. I'm going to turn this over to sure. Colonel Hearn right now, if you don't mind. Uh, Scholar Hearn, DPS. Uh, yes, as, as you're aware, uh, Chapter 66 of the Code of Criminal Procedures kind of governs the disposition reporting, and there are two parts to it. A, a conviction is not final for 30 days after it's issued. So there's a 30-day there's a window that starts that, and then from final disposition, you have a 30-day reporting window. So it's actually a total of 60 days from end to end, if you look at it completely. So uh, I believe the intent here is to take that second 30 days sure. and make it seven in the first year and make it five in the second year to, to shave off that time. Okay, where are we in terms of compliance with the very broad, and I'm glad you gave us the current state of law, that was going to be my next question, so you have the 30 and the 30. What is the, what is the percent that we're requiring these agencies to have to receive grant funding now? It, it is the, we, we, again, as those of you that practice are aware, 100% uh, disposition is, is an impossibility. There are 70,000 arrests a month. 
and as those trickle through the criminal justice system to try to get a disposition, uh, a contested case may take months or years to ever see a courtroom to have that. So we look at a five-year average to try to catch up and not penalize people for things out of their control. Uh, so the five-year average is 90% requirement for grant funding, and as a state, we're at 95% when we look at that. So we're, we're doing a very good job at trying to reach 100% of available dispositions instead of 100% of all dispositions. Good, and then now, I want to be very particular. We're talking about convictions. We're, well, I, in that, the numbers that you stated there, we're talking about convictions? We're talking about all dispositions, I think, because Deferred adjudication is. Well, even, even an acquittal impacts an individual's sure. right in this process. So you can close right? so, this So out. you want everything, you want all arrest. But in terms of precluding someone from possessing a firearm, yes. the convictions are, that, that, convictions that's the piece of the, the puzzle that the matters. Piece. Yes. And so now we're shortening the timeline so that we have better information at the roadside. So a trooper, her queries, is going to find that information further ahead in the process. Now, 37 days is still a lengthy period of time, but that's 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 the conviction piece, correct? That is, and, and it impacts the side of the road or a, a, a firearms check from a... Good point, because I want to talk about that. Um, this doesn't capture, however, um, these statistics. We're not touching uh, FFJ warrants or in-state warrants, sorry, fugitive from justice warrants, so out-of-state warrants or in-state warrants. That, that's not something that we, uh, th th this, th these, these statistics or these goals aren't including either of those categories. Is that right? This, this is a particular piece, correct, yeah. of the whole, of the whole pie. But now when you go in, let's say, to your point, to go get a background check for firearm, a fugitive from justice warrant will pop up in that query. Is that correct? There, there's a, a true federal fugitive from justice warrant will pop up in that query. Okay, now distinguish between when you say a true fugitive, fugitive from justice warrant and... In, in 2017, prior to 2017, the FBI recognized all wanted in-state violations. So uh, an aggravated assault warrant, a murder warrant, uh, any felony warrant that the state of Texas has in its system, it would recognize that as a prohibitor. In 2017, uh, DOJ looked at what the definition in the statute is and identified that it is truly a federal fugitive from justice. You have to have interstate flight for it to apply. Therefore, they will not use an in-state warrant, misdemeanor or felony, as a prohibitor today. So, um, I mean, we see that quite a bit from New Mexico into Texas out in El Paso where you have FFJ warrant. That's a true, in this, this is a true FFJ, because they have a warrant from out of state, they've come into El Paso, we've incarcerated them on some other charge and they've been picked up, or they've just been picked up straight on that warrant up. when yeah. they're stopped at the roadside. Um, so w what would the state of Texas have to do to capture the in-state warrants for those, fel and, and I don't know what we'd want to capture for, maybe all only felonies, maybe certain misdemeanors like domestic violence, or what would we have to do to be able to capture those? Because it sounds like it's been determined that we're not, those aren't truly captured by the law as it stands now. Uh, if it was the desire of the, of the body, the state would have to pass a statute that says if a person has an active felony warrant or an active class B or above warrant in the system in Texas, uh, the federal NICS will recognize that as a prohibitor during that time frame that it's active. So someone comes in, and I think we saw an incident here in Austin that's fairly on, on point where they had an in-state warrant, um, went to go purchase a firearm. Had that been the law at the time, they would have been a prohibited person. Correct. Okay. That's something, um, that's something I certainly think that we should consider and think about um, if the goal is to make sure that we, we've decided that there are certain individuals we do not want to have access to firearms. Now, defining who those are, what warrants we want to include, I think is a very important part of this discussion. And that's where the, I think the details certainly matter. Um, I want to expand into protective orders um, because I know that we have pretty strict requirements that didn't used to in terms of getting the protective orders into the system so that when you're at roadside, you can query into them. So if you've got boyfriend, girlfriend in the car, there's a protective order that says they're not to be within X amount, he's not supposed to be in X amount of feet of her. 
troopers at the roadside, that protective order comes back. She's the protected party. And now we've got a violation of protective order. And in that instance, it's going to be a new criminal offense that you can apprehend that individual for. So there was a time when protective orders weren't being uploaded into the system quickly enough, much like we talked about these convictions, right? Right. Uh, a little bit different because protective orders don't does, do not require the final, quote unquote, final conviction, right? This is a pretrial mechanism. Um, we've increased the expectation for local law enforcement to have this stuff in the system. Can you, and I don't remember off the top of my head, what, what is the standard that we now have for protective orders? Um, ideally, it's within 48 hours. Okay. So 48 hours between issuing, and we're talking about emergency protective order, orders and then also what we would call the permanent, but they're not permanent, they're two year protective Correct. orders. Okay. So in those categories, we're talking about domestic violence. So someone who's, who's, who's put under protective order for domestic violence, uh, sexual assault, stalking, and I believe we've added human trafficking. Correct. Right. So is, is it data, and some of this would be questions I'd like for you to provide some of this to the committee. Sure. Is there data that can be provided? Because now we're dumping that into the system. And I've looked at it myself. When you query, because in those protective orders, the judge can make a determination whether at the emergency ex parte hearing or later can make a determination that this is an individual that should not possess firearms. That's the current law today. Is that correct? Yes. You know, those first four circumstances. Right. Um, is, the, is, the, is the data available for us to give us a snapshot, and it may be in the past somewhere, uh, of how many protective orders in those four categories are being issued where they're checking that box. Because the judge doesn't have to make that uh, make that protect that piece of the protective order. They don't have to say this person can't possess firearms. It is an option to the judge in those cases. Is there a way that we can get the data that breaks it down for us so that I, we can I'll, see how many times that's being utilized? I'll check to see what data we have available and if not I will get with OCA and see if yeah because uh, and, and I was I know with dealing with OCA you have to go back a few years and that's fine I just want to get a snapshot sure. because when we talk about people that shouldn't possess firearms we're looking for overlap and mass shooters something that I look at very closely is domestic violence right it the feds when we met with them here in Austin in criminal car you're in the room they said there is a large overlap between those who have domestic violence history and those who are involved in, in mass, mass shootings. And they also said there were a particular number, I don't remember the number they stated, but they said there were a particular number that were under a protective order, weren't supposed to have access to firearms, under the law as it was, and still we had the incident happen. And so while I believe there are gaps in our protective order laws and that we can expand them to, to, to look at other conduct, I think it is absolutely inexcusable for us to look at the law as it is today for domestic violence, for sexual assault, for stalking, for human trafficking, where a judge has made a determination that this person is dangerous and shouldn't have a weapon, it is inexcusable for, for us as a state to, to turn a blind eye to the statistics that show us those are the people that are involved in mass shootings, those are the people that are going to go commit acts of violence against their intimate partners, over 100 a year, that are under protective order now and we're not doing anything about it. And I know other jurisdictions, you know, I mean, Dallas is trying to do their own program. I know that El Paso is going to try to set up their own program. It's a resource problem. But if I'm taking the governor's directive seriously uh, in terms of getting weapons out of the hands of people that shouldn't have them, we made a determination. One, we, one thing we're, we're trying to do to, to, to aid in that effort, both with conditions of bond and protective orders, uh, currently an officer on the side of the road will get an indication that there is an item there but if you have a four-page protective order, mm -hmm. they're not seeing all the uh, criteria within it. How can we? Time. So we're we're trying to expand to the degree we can expand it. It's it's not a lot, but it's almost like a like a Twitter character uh, uh -huh. restriction. Uh, we're expanding the miscellaneous field in our system that will allow uh, the people that enter the protective order or the condition of bond to put some of those key factors in there, uh, so that an officer inside the road can see that at the time and not have to. Uh, worry about not seeing what's on page three of the protective order. Sure. Well, I mean, I think it'd be very important for anyone at the roadside if they have protective order pop up. Say this individual's under protect. This individual subject to protective order. Judges made a determination they should not possess firearms. I think for officer safety, I, I'd want to search that car and make sure there's no weapons in that person's possession. Right. Because otherwise, I mean, there's a crime being committed. I think they have enough information at their hand just with the protective order. And so, I, I again, I believe there are. There's other conduct, including terroristic threats, that we should weave into our current protective order statutes. Um, but at the very least, 
at the very least, we need to figure out how to work with the data that you all house, and we can talk to OCA as well. I'd love to see this data. Um, I'd love to also see someone who is under a protective order who had been told by a judge not to possess a firearm was later arrested for a crime involving a firearm. I think that data we should, should be available. We should, we should be able to pull that for you. I, and I know that we've got to go back in time, and that's fine, but I want to know because the feds made it very clear to us that a significant overlapping factor here, and it's not all of them, it's not in every case, but domestic violence is, is, is something that we need to be more serious about. And I don't want to denigrate the work that people have done in the past because people are doing a lot in this arena, but there's, there's more to be done here. And, and we, are, we are leaving weapons in the hands of people that have, that if we have the system in place, we flagged them, a judge has determined this, and yet they still have weapons in their hands. And so I appreciate the data you can give to us because it makes it easier for us to do our job. Yes, sir. Thank you. Reverend. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Colonel McCraw and, and, uh, and Skyler, I appreciate y'all being here. Uh, and before I, I have some follow-up questions on, on what uh, Chair Moody was asking, but before I get to that, I just want to uh, express the gratitude of the people of Odessa. On August 31st, when we experienced our darkest day, uh, DPS uh, came through with flying colors. Uh, we appreciate all of the support on that day and in the days that have followed. Uh, we also are very happy to hear about Trooper Pryor, who of course was the, the first uh, victim uh, that day, and we're happy to hear that he's uh, recovering uh, very well in our, uh, and uh, anyway, we continue to provide him all the support. Just okay. in following up on the conviction reporting, uh, and Skyler, this is more for, for you, is this a, can you confirm that this is strictly an administrative function? In other words, that reporting, uh, if we're looking at reducing the, uh, the deadline for reporting a final conviction, uh, can we confirm that that is an administrative uh, function that takes place entirely after the criminal proceeding has, has concluded? It, it, it's a three-part function, actually, because you have the arresting information that has to come in initially, and there's a seven-day window on that uh, statutorily uh, for the most of the state. In fact, all the state, we're electronic now with live scans, so it's usually 20, uh, within 24 hours. So you have that, that arrest sitting there in the system. Then the prosecutors next in the, in the string or in the, the continuum, they either agree to accept the charge, they may dismiss the charge, there may be a pretrial diversion or some other disposition that could go to that arrest. If, it, if there is a final conviction or an acquittal, it's the court and then the clerk's job to put that in there. So it's, a, it's really a county effort. Mm -hmm. and, and along those lines, I also wanted to follow up on the protect boards. We did pass legislation during uh, D during this year's session that, it, and I don't know, I know that the Office of Court Administration is still working on uh, the database that helps uh, the, the communication across jurisdictional lines. Uh, if there are, uh, you know, local, uh, like a district court, say, or, or a, a county court even, that uh, that issues a protective order for domestic violence or, or for any other purpose, um, and then that's reported to a, a database, is that going to make it easier for other law enforcement entities to be able to access that information within that so that that 48 hour reporting period is a little bit stronger yeah get, getting getting the those uh orders into the nci or tcic for texas but in the ncic ultimately is what law enforcement uses to look at that so the faster whatever the the solution is for the courts and the clerks getting that into the the database is helpful okay thank you lieutenant crow Appreciate you. Representative Gordon Hawkins. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and gentlemen. I want to bring the discussion more around the people. And, you know, law enforcement, I think, has a major role to play, but also the community has a role to play. And so my question is, have y'all laid out what I consider long-term plans and short-term plans and how we engage every facet of the community to address this issue? And I, and I see listed, you know, the school districts, uh, mental health professionals and all of that. But what about those one-offs when we have uh, a parent who, who's in desperate need because their child is, 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 uh, is uh, demonstrating some, some concerns? And have y'all looked at big picture? Because for me, it's an issue not only dealing with law enforcement and the laws we have in place and the criminal justice system, but it's also those things that deal with the social aspects and people and communities and how y'all looking at, at that. 
You make some good points. I mean, the, the governor is very clear about one of the one of the executive orders and uh, directives that we've received is you know what can we do to raise public awareness? And of course, in the school setting, we're talking about you know other students, we're talking about teachers, we're talking about parents. But uh, if it's not just schools; it's churches, it's other places, it's it's the entire state. So how do we? address that and of course what we've been doing as a state and I think Texas has always been forward leaning on what we do from a response standpoint. At the Texas State University and the alert program and the craze program right now, the citizens response to active uh, shooters, that's a, those are very important programs to teach people what they can do in those situations. But your point is that we don't want to, you know, you know that's, that's what, when it happens. What we want to do is prevent it from happening and that means educating everyone in terms of what are those pre-attack indicators. Because, you know, what's frustrating is you can go back after every one of these cases and you can see things, if, if taken together, if known and taken together, then, it, then certainly you, 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 someone would, would think that action would be taken based on the totality of circumstances if, if that information was provided. So have your department taken a position on any of these issues? You know, one of the issues is high magazine weapons. You know, have y'all taken any position on that? Have y'all taken a position on, on the loopholes that occur? Have y'all taken a position on those things that we think impact this environment and what happens? Oh, man, we don't take positions. We just implement in terms of what policymakers like yourself, you know, tell us to do is the bottom line. So let's set aside that for a second. Yeah and say, let's talk about life, okay? Mm -hmm. And how we as lawmakers, because the thing I, I'm always concerned about, and no doubt, doubt, you know, we're a country of laws and we need to follow. But we also have to look at what's happening in, in our environment and how we began to work together because a lot of bureaucracy creates a lot of the challenges. You know, y'all don't take a position, okay? And this entity, don't take a position. and. This is said. This is you know our piece here, but what happens to the continu continuum that needs to occur so we can deal with and have some real impact on some of these things that are happening? Well, I think obviously I think the governor identified eight things that are that are meaningful if they happen right now, and resource will have a dramatic impact on that on the preventive side. But again, there's there's so there's so many threats right now, and our concern and the governor's concern about the escalation of those things. Uh, it, it, we need to get everybody involved. Every person has got to be aware of their surroundings and be able to and willing to report suspicious activity when they see it. Well, I, I just like to add this as a comment, and and I think some of these things are great, uh, but uh, my biggest concern mm -hmm. is how we engage the community more not just the subject matter expert part of the community, but the other part of the community, because that's where my concern. Well, I think it's a great concern. I mean, every person matters. I mean, again, when you go back to it, it's, it's the brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, okay, the cousins, they're the ones that saw something, okay? If they would have said something or would have had that coupled with something else, we may have been in a, a much better position to prevent. But in these situations, relatives did say something. So what was yeah. the, the Depending gap? On the, yeah, but there's some places they did and some they didn't. And that's the, there's, it, again, it's, it's about how do you get that in the system and report it to law enforcement because in the end of the day, you know, the law enforcement is the best position to protect somebody, okay, from an immediate and imminent threat, and they need, they need that information. And we just got to find a system to do that. We have a system to be able to do it and encourage people to report into it. Well, my final question is yeah. this. Right now, if a parent if a parent sees a child in trouble and they call law, local law enforcement and they ask the local law enforcement, hey, my son is, you know, and I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. Well, if he hasn't, ma'am, if he hasn't committed a crime, there's nothing we can do. Well, that's, that's what we're going to do, the training aspect of it in terms of, if it's, it, it, it doesn't have to be a, a, an element of a crime. What it, what it can be is an indicator of a possible a pre-indicator of a or indicator of possible action that would, would indicate that uh, there can be an attack or a terrorist attack or a crime is committed. So it's just it doesn't have to be okay after the fact reporting. It can simply be a reasonable indicator that 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 based on the behavior that's being observed, okay, that, that one would believe 
that a crime could be, or they're thinking about committing a crime or an act of terrorism. So there's some training modules out there that will speak to the law enforcement officer so that he doesn't turn that parent down and just say, we can't do it. And, and that's one of the directives that we got. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and, and every call point, yeah, exactly. Not just, not just in terms of law enforcement, but, but the analyst, the dispatcher, the communications, the public safety officer that's working, all of them are trained in that regard. I think Representative Johnson has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thank you for your service. Um, I just wanted to go back to kind of a previous line of questioning because I just want to make sure I understood. So when you're getting the data in, um, obviously you have conviction rates. Um, now we were, we were talking about arrest, the, just the arrest process, and then getting that data uploaded. How does the, uh, that affect the background check and, and abilities of per, ability, uh, someone's ability to purchase a weapon merely after the arrest phase? If, if there's an, an unadjudicated arrest when, I guess I should back up. So the, the background check process, uh, typically referred to as a NICS check, is really a check of three databases, not one. Nix has its own database of certain files, but there's also at the same time a check of NCIC, which is your, your temporary database of protective orders and wanted fugitives and those kind of temporary things that expire. And then there's a check of the uh, Interstate Identification Index, or triple I, which is the national version of the criminal history file, which is a permanent file. So that that unadjudicated arrest in a Texas scenario, uh, Nix would see that in the triple I check. And then they would, looking at what type of offense it is, if there is some kind of prosecutorial action going on, it could be a prohibitor. So you might get a delayed response on your gun purchase until they have three business days to reach out to Texas and figure out whether there's an information or an indictment maybe that has come from that arrest that hasn't been adjudicated, and if there is no such thing, then it's probably not a prohibitor, and then the sale would go through. And I guess uh, kind of another question I have is, obviously, the background check uh, process is something um, that's been highly discussed in terms of trying as a vehicle to minimize access for people that should have access minimized. Do you have any um, recommendations um, or thoughts on additional data points that need to be factored into the background check process um, besides uh, protective orders and um, conviction histories or, or whatever else. Or where, and also, where is it? Is it published somewhere? The criteria that is used that would be in a background check as a basis for denial of purchase. Y yes, ma'am. The FBI website under the Nix program list the basically there's nine prohibitive categories uh, and if you need me to I can list those but would you like me to um, go well over? and I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on do you believe that those criteria um, for background checks need to be enhanced um, any further in order to um, make the background check process more effective I think we discussed one area that may need to be reviewed is the fugitive area, uh, but I'm happy to sit down with you and your staff if you'd like to learn more about the process and see if, if there are things that you've identified that we could uh, in brief you on. Chairman Guerin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thank you for being here today. Um, if you fill out a 4473, obviously you didn't tell the truth. It's a federal felony at this point. But they don't ever prosecute. Is there any way the ATF can provide that information to the state as well as to the FBI? And could we make it a state felony? Because you, you I mean, you falsified information on a federal document, you can go to jail for 10 years and be fined a quarter million dollars. But they've only prosecuted 12 cases out of over 100,000 that have that were denied because of background checks. Is there any way we can have ATF provide this information to the state where the state then, working with the local district attorneys, the state could prosecute these people and let us put them in jail? The shooter in, El in, in Odessa, the shooter in Odessa lied on a federal form and the person, he was denied, so he bought a firearm from someplace else. 
we prosecute him and he was in Huntsville right now, it wouldn't have happened. So is there some means that we can access or have a ATF provide us with the information of the Texas Fusion Center and then we can and then we can actively pursue that either through DPS or local law enforcement? I think it's possible, but it would take some, some talking through because part of the issue is you don't know until that form gets to ATF, it's not part of the background check right. initial. The background check is biographical, name, date of birth, et cetera, when you do the NICS check. So the, the, the information on the form itself, it goes through the, through the mail or through the process. When a, a gun store owner processes and he gets information back, you cannot sell this guy a gun. Yes. And so obviously ATF found something that said you cannot sell this guy a gun. Can they provide that information? They're providing it to the FBI who then who investigates it, then goes to the uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office, the U.S. Attorney's Office says whether it's prosecuted. Can it, it all, that information also be provided to the state of Texas? And then we can decide if we want to prosecute him unless pass a state law that said it's, it's against the law to lie on that federal court. I, I think you could. If, if you had, if a district attorney would take a falsifying a government record on a federal document, you could do it without that. But if otherwise, you would need a state law that said that's a crime, and then we could, could do so. And, and we could talk to ATF right now to see if they're willing to share that information. I think, that's, I think that would be an immediate step forward if they would. And I know my district attorney would do everything she can to stop what happened in Odessa or El Paso. I think the uh, ATF would welcome it, frankly. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair Garen, are your figures, are those for Texas uh, a applications for a firearm? The, the, governor, the governor provided this, and he said there were, it was federal. There were 112,000 denied transactions. ATF only referred 12,700 of these to the field divisions, and then the U.S. Attorney's Office only prosecuted 12, and that's as of June of Last year. No, so, numbers. I mean, there's 112,000 people out there that lied on the federal form. And only 12 of those were prosecuted. And I don't know how many of those were in or Texas. Texas yeah. But one of those was in Texas because he shot a bunch of people in Odessa. Yeah. Okay. Members, any other questions? Go ahead. Thank Chair you. Walling. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Colonel, I'm sure you're familiar with the United States Secret Service National Threat Assessment Center. Yes, sir. And um, that's actually sort of a new concept, the, the term threat assessment. What does that mean to you? I know there's a, there's a definition in their most recent report, July of 2019. Uh, do you all follow the same type of philosophy? Well, I don't want to say philosophy, but the mechanics in trying to um, ferret out some of these folks that are uh, manifesting these type of behaviors? Yes, sir. When Secret Service has a model, as does the FBI, uh, DHS has a model, uh, a threat assessment that uh, is for fixed objects or like the Capitol or buildings and things like this, and we've used, we've used all of those particular models. And uh, it's, it's, it's important to have a structured way and disciplined way to be able to assess threats. And we do it, frankly, we, you know, there's threats against members. We use a similar type of situation on that. Uh, and we're very, uh, it's important to capture it that way. They, they issued a report in, in a, uh, July of 2019, and it talks about mass attacks in public spaces. Um, and yeah. do you have, obviously we're, it's, it's from 2017, we're actually unfortunately having to update it with some of our own um, mass attacks in public spaces. But um, with the new call, with from the governor, um, do you believe we have enough tools in our toolbox to implement some of these recommendations? I guess the eight that were mentioned. Um, what other tools do you need from the legislature to be able to kind of identify these threat assessments, mm -hmm. but actually go after them and and stamp them out? I mean, I know there's some a lot of mechanics to it, uh, as Chair Moody mentioned, particularly when you're being precise about folks that. Uh, could have protective orders, um, 
and is it a conviction or not a conviction? Um, what 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 do we need? Well, what, what else do we well, need? One of the, the two key things is that one in these uh, when you, you saw one of the executive orders that talked about a multidisciplinary, multi-agency threat assessment cells. Okay, in the in the field, well, that means that it's not just special agents that are assigned to that, or law enforcement personnel, but a psychiatrist as well and somebody that's tied to the community in terms of it has expertise, because locals do this quite often in terms of committing people, but has it, but, but not all agencies are. And if someone needs to be committed, you know, based upon the information that's out there, you know, be able to move quickly on threats to life. So that's, you know, one key. So, so it's, that's, again, that's resourced in that, in that area. The same thing we were talking a little earlier about in terms of a threat assessment section within the fusion center we already do threat assessments, okay, and we do it on people and on things, but to be able to have it, but also the monitoring piece. And, of course, we're moving analysts over to do that, and that's another example in terms of resources that would make a difference. So the, 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 the fusion centers, you said there are eight fusion centers. Yes, sir. There's one that's, I guess, considered the main hub uh, is, is, is what I understood. Um, how many people are staffed at, at those fusion centers? Well, we have over 150 people if you count all the people that we have within the ICT, which is what we've done, which is most, most agencies can't do that. And I'm sorry, let me, let me yeah. stop you because yeah. what does ICT mean? Oh, and I'm sorry, Intelligence and Counterterrorism Division. Okay. So what we've done within, basically. Within our own department. Yeah, within our own department, okay. exactly. So we, we've basically taken that division, okay, and co-located with the Fusion Center because there's, the, there's overlapping issues. Counterterrorism is always going to be some of the things we've talked about today and a need for those, that type of information. But the, even, even other programs that are information driven, even like the uh, Texas uh, Top 10 Wanted uh, Fugitive Program in terms of getting information out of the public, or all of those things are, require information and data. And uh, the same thing with our watch center that's around the clock. So, so. Is it our, our, I know what a new focus, particularly with, with El Paso and, and yes, the sir. tragedy that happened there, particularly somebody who was, uh, uh, had racial animus towards uh, uh, Mexicans, were you not looking at those, were resources not looking at those prior to that shooting um, occurring? There was no, there was no resources. Or that, I'm sorry, that, personnel. Yeah, there's no personnel that. that I'm aware of that were monitoring the types of forms that we've been talking about. It, uh, plain and simple, that, what, that did not exist. Now, I, they're, they're, in fact, m m the ones I, examples I've talked about is the public that saw those and reported those. We've got other right. examples where the public saw something in California that was happening in Texas and reported it to a fusion center that got to us and were able to follow up on that regard. So, so to your point, yes, uh, there's not uh, the proactive part <clears throat> is now is now just beginning. It's now beginning. Yes. So sir. your your goal, and particularly I know that the governor has has created a, a committee, particularly on domestic terrorism, and and in in particular, pinning that down to to uh, neo-Nazi behavior. Are we going to go in, is the agency, meaning your agency, going to take particular focus on that subgroup of folks that, that would pop up in the threat assessment? Yes, sir. All the ones that uh, we've talked about, and, there, and there's more that we're concerned about, and we'll be proactive in that regard. When you, now, when you recognizing, say more, recognizing that the, the people have a right to say, say things right. even that uh, is, is as reprehensible as it is, they can say those things, it's freedom of speech. But again, we're, we're, we're entitled to be able to observe <clears throat> and indicators that might concern us in terms of encouraging people to go kill someone, for example, or adopt the same type of strategy that they used in Christchurch, or counting the body counts, right? those types of things. We know that, that, that active shooters in the past or some of these mass killers have, have paid attention, unfortunately, you know, very close attention. Another group that uh, this the, the, uh, that, that this concern about uh, because of the similarities across the board is this uh, the incel community, the, uh, the, in, the, in, the uh, involuntary celibates, okay, that, that name themselves in that regard. So though all, those, all those groups, obviously, when, they, when there's individuals that start talking about something that, that uh, raises a concern or to, to, to a threat, then we, we should be able to move on it. Okay. So back to my, my initial, I guess my, my initial uh, theme to my, to my question was, do you have enough resources to do, to go after folks like that? Well, it's, of course, you know, we don't have as much as we, uh, we need in the long run. We'll need more resources in the long run to be able to do that. 
because we'll be generating it because not only will we need it to be able to identify those but then to follow up and vet those things as they come through what what particularly yeah. are you able yeah. and this is this is probably for a question <clears throat> later but but for the committee um, could you share with the committee your budget you know what what you need uh, what you have currently and what you uh, would need to be able to you know beef up the agency to go after these type of threat assessments um, you know particularly in, in Texas yes sir we, okay. have, we have those numbers. Okay. Um, that's all. Okay. Representative Frank Leon. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you again, Colonel. Um, <clears throat> I am definitely one of those people who are worried about a potential slippery slope here, right? Mm -hmm. of, of privacy matters, uh, First Amendment, Fourth Amendment, and so on. Um, but I also wanted to give a little bit of color of something that happened in, in my district, something that happened on social media. So on, on July 10th, there was a fellow who was originally reported to have been in my district, which is why I was interested. It turned out he was not. But so on July 10th, he was arrested by Secret Service for making threats to the President of the United States. So about 24 hours later or so, I, I saw the article and I went on one of the big social media uh, web pages, and that person's account was still open. So I just wanted to, if it's okay with the Chairman, give you what this person had posted a month and even more. Uh, before he was ultimately arrested. And he said uh, that, hey, I recently signed up for college classes. The stress uh, reminds me of why I dropped out of university. I'm microdosing on shrooms and LSD. That helped me reset my brain functions for the better. I have no idea how to get them. I have no connections, no friends, and no social skills. For 20 straight months now, openly and publicly, I have been calling for President Trump's death. So this is someone who is clearly out publicly talking about stuff that's illegal. Mm -hmm. And while I do worry about the super <clears throat> slope, of course, if I go on Facebook and I, if I don't capitalize it in my ad, they get upset, mm -hmm. all right? Because, but at the same time, you have a fellow who is, and if you look at his posts in context, it's clearly someone who's a danger. And it took a while to get to him. So. I just want to give some color about the kind of posts that we're talking about and uh, the, the, the magnitude of the effort that you would have to put in, too, to keep an eye on all of this. Well, I mean, obviously, it's uh, the, the world, what, the digital world we live in, it's just, it's, it's, it's enormous. So to the extent we can work with companies and be able to use technology, software, to be able to limit and identify protocols that would bring us to keywords that would be able to help us work smarter and faster, that's obviously optimum in that regard. And there's, unfortunately, there's people that are, are, are they, in the, the majority of the, the individuals are attackers right now that uh, are not motivated by ideation, but they're, they're, they're seeking their first deranged and they're, they're seeking notoriety or uh, to address a grievance. And we've seen that recently in that regard. There's no shortage of that, okay, in the world, unfortunately. On top of that, we, we we're mindful that Al-Qaeda uh, Sunni extremists, ISIS, uh, even Hezbollah, seeks to destroy us in our way of life. And ISIS has done a very good job through the cyber world in terms of radicalizing our own people. So the threats are many, the challenges are many, and of course you, and we're reluctant to even say how much resources it takes. What it, what it has to take, it has to take a, a combined effort, and combined meaning not just state but, but federal effort to make sure that we're, we're complementing each other and not duplicating each other that to the extent that we put more agents on the, the Joint Terrorism Task Forces to, to handle the domestic terrorism aspect of it and follow up in, in life to thri uh, threat to life types of leads, integrated with these threat assessment teams, and if we have to you know, move additional resources like we're doing right now that haven't been funded, we're just using them because right now this is very important to address these threat to life and this escalation that we've had, and the governor's directed us to do so. Chairman Blanco. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I've got a question regarding straw purchasers of firearms. Um, what, what data does DPS have um, that provides us an outlook of, of crimes correlated with those type of straw purchase purchases? We don't. Uh, we, we can tell you crimes committed with firearms through our UCR program data, but it doesn't go down to the depth of whether that was legally purchased or illegally purchased. Uh, we can tell you how many weapons are stolen 
from law-abiding gun owners every year or otherwise, uh, and kind of a thin level of information to that degree. But uh, usually the investigative piece that does the gun trace to find out where where the gun uh, originated, how it got into that person's hands, doesn't make it to that reporting level. It's, it's kind of inside the case file, and you have to look at all those files. So what recommendations does the department have um, to, to provide that information or to, to I guess, prosecute or, or identify these individuals sooner or faster? Um, what, what, is a, what are the recommendations to the department? I don't, I don't know that we've, we've looked specifically at that piece, but we'll be glad to, to get with you on it. Okay. Thank you. Please do so. Chair Moody. So I'm going to follow up on that. <clears throat> so would you have data on, so crimes committed with firearms, whether that individual, law, individually, individual lawfully possessed that firearm? Is that data we could have? Only if it's reported from the reporting agency as a, as a secondary offense. As an unlawful possession? Yes. Okay, now you mentioned you would be able to have the data on stolen firearms. Now that's only those that are reported though. That is correct. Any idea how many go unreported? Annually, there's, we're somewhere around 18,000 reported firearm thefts in Texas a year. Uh, and I don't think we know what we don't know. Do we require people to report that when firearms are stolen no. or lost? Okay. No. Would, that, would that information be helpful to law enforcement? It, yes. Thank you. Representative Lang. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Follow-up question on the fusion centers. Uh, when you get information on threats, um, you investigate the threats or the information from the threats. Um, do you have a retention policy on that information uh, is it purged if it's found to be not credible? Uh, what do you do with that information? Yeah, we, we use the DOJ guidelines on it. And, it, it, uh, and of course, we, and from an enforcement standpoint, you know, DHS uh, does, a, does an evaluation of each fusion center each year. And of course, internally from us, because of our, the, the repository for those reports, as I watch, is our privacy officer does periodic checks and evaluations, just to, you know, again, routine audits the data to make sure that we're complying with the DOJ guidelines and, and the, uh, the, the functional requirements that we, the DHS has set out. And we've really incorporated within our, our Texas Fusion Center's policy. Thank you. Yes, Representative Gerald Hawkins. Question, um, I don't know if you can answer this or not, but wh who are the players in the multidisciplinary threat team? Right now, there's 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 no players, it, 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 because it's we, we, we've assigned special agents to it. Those teams are there. We're going to add an analyst to it. Will be the first part. Then, and, and as funding comes available, a psychiatrist and uh, excuse me, a psychologist will be uh, assigned to those teams. And of course, then working with local agencies, those non-commissioned professionals that they will that they have, and sometimes are victim witness. Coordinators, some uh, people that have a particular skills will be added to it, but uh, those are the, that's the intention is to uh, is to get the, the psychologist and get the analyst and uh, to get them assigned to these teams. And, and the goal of that makeup is to determine the psychological position of people, or well, to better assess the threat itself. And you know, we talked about a little bit we talked about the Secret Service protocol on some of those threats and it always helps to have someone that's got a, an expertise or a discipline in these types of evaluations and, and of course the challenge is and it came up in one of the discussions we had that uh, the, the speaker was involved in and and uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and certainly uh, Chairman Blanco was involved in when we were talking about El Paso is that there's a you know there's a need sometimes the the answer is not jail okay there's other answers out there and to the extent we know what those other options are, that this whole person can get treated, is we need the people that can identify those things. And so law enforcement that are working these threats to life are in a better position to be able to resolve them successfully. And that analyst role, is that the, the analyzing, not just the profile of the individual, but the content, of the material they're spewing out? It, it, it's, it's, it's the volume of, of threats to life to coming in, evaluating those, plus 
you're looking for data on that. Okay, something, a threat came in, you know, who, what, when, why, where, what are those things? I can use the databases to be able to research that, capture that data, and be able to provide that to support those special agents that are looking for that person that was involved in that particular threat. Do we have a timeline to put these? Well, the agents already assigned, okay, we've, we've done that, and that, we've identified the supervisors and we've assigned the agents. The, uh, the, uh, they will also uh, see, will seek top secret clearances for them so they can be cross-vetted in terms of joint, on the Joint Terrorism Task Forces. And we've already identified th those agents that are being assigned and we'll get their top secret clearances that are going to the Joint Terrorism Task Forces. Thank you. Okay, we've, we've been at it for a while, but I want to circle back. There are three orders, order one, two, and three, that set time frames. Uh, the first two are 30 days, the sec and the third is 60 days. So can you give the committee an update on your process and your, your, your ability to move forward with fulfilling order number one within 30 days about developing <coughs> standardized intake questions? Yes. Where, where are you in that process? Well, we're, we're well into it. We've looked at it. We've got a draft, okay, of what that intake document looks like, and, uh, and we would... And of course, we we'll also want to be able to peer review that and work with our local partners to be able to, to vet that and see if there's, uh, they have better ideas or missing categories or something like that. So we already have a, a straw man or a draft at this point in time. And, and your intent is to disseminate that into the 911 operators and 311 operators, is that yes, sir. correct? Yes, sir. Do they currently have available to them today uh, any sort of developmental questions that they use, or they have they just not um, the, utilized the, further there, questions to develop that information? There, there's some, and in, in, in various different jurisdictions are using different ones, and, and depending upon what agency it is, some have adopt, adopted some of the questions that Secret Service has, and some of the, the FBI has. So there's there's a number of lists out there, and we're looking at all of those lists to see what's again. You can't. Uh, we want to make it in a way that it's effective because they have a, 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 sh a very short window of time that they're dealing with this individual and make sure that they capture those things that are a priority. So and the same thing with our communication specialists. We want to speak to what our, our even our dispatchers. Yes, sir. Yeah. Specifically for this, for this order, we included the CSEC, which is kind of the rural 911, right. as well as the 911 association to get the urban areas uh, on the front end to ensure that we have their input but this is going to be kind of an all points uh, template. So if it's 311, if it's 911, if it's calling the receptionist at the front desk uh, to represent Garvin Harkin's piece, is even if it doesn't meet the call for service standard, now they take what information they have and they give it to someone who can then follow up on it, even if it's not your job to follow up on it. So it'll, it'll be across the board, all call point kind of template. To, to acquire the information. The second order deals with an appropriate legal standard uh, for when and how that information is passed on to the uh, suspicious activity report. So can you tell us or share how you're developing that legal uh, criteria, working with uh, district attorneys, law enforcement? T tell us how you're doing that. Yes, sir. And this, this one actually we're well way ahead because we adopted the uh, information sharing environment functional standards for suspicious activities that was developed by Department of Homeland Security. And as I mentioned before, it was a result of the Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act in uh, 2004. So we've, we've actually incorporated that in for all fusion centers. To be a fusion center in Texas, you have to embrace that. And the Department of uh, Justice uh, guidelines relates to the uh, information sharing or capturing of suspicious activity reporting. So we're, we, <coughs> excuse me, we have those right now, so it's a matter of codifying that, you know, and making that something that uh, anything that goes into it that way. But the, the fusion centers practice that at this point in time. Okay. Then once you develop uh, your criteria and questions <clears throat> through orders one and two, then you'll have another 30 days after that within which to go ahead and train uh, law enforcement yeah. officers. Do you have resources available to you to do that? Yes, we'll, we'll, we'll do help uh, T-Call, because T-Call has a lead on that particular one, and we'll use some of the same resources we're using right now that is teaching Craze or, or Alert and some of the other uh, programs that we're involved in that relate to, well, the after the fact, the response, but relate to certainly uh, mass killings of people. 
And I guess even after all the questions, I'm still at a loss as to how mm -hmm. these, I mean, obviously the local fusion center here, the main one, the public fusion center, is, it's referred to, I think, in the act there are two types of fu fusion centers. One is the primary fusion center, which yes, is sir. that the one located here in Austin. Yes, sir, that's, that's the one and that we And then there are see. recognized fusion center, centers, and those are seven more throughout the state of Texas. Yes, sir. Now, are those funded through grants from the federal government? Are they are they run by local entities? Tell me, the run by state the state have any role in those? No, they're run by local entities, all, all except for the state one and the the primary one, which is we, the Department of Public Safety runs. But all of them are run by local agent, local and state agencies. No federal agencies oversees fusion centers. Federal agencies will put people and analysts into those fusion centers. And of course, going back to the funding piece, it depends on where it's at. Some of it can be Homeland Security grant funds that supports that fusion center. And, and some of it can be from the urban areas, uh, uh, urban area grant funds that are related to Homeland Security. And, and they're used in that way as well. And it can be for people and certainly it can be for whether, you know, location along those lines. I can tell you that, uh, <clears throat> but most of them, though, will also use their own resources. They've already made up their mind that they're going to dedicate resources. El Paso Police Department, for example, is using its analysts and its officers to operate the El Paso Fusion Center. Uh, similarly, the San Antonio is doing this well. Because fusion, in any way, at the basic level, fusion is really intelligence. And so it's, it's fusing information and that it use that information. So whether it's crime, it's terrorism, threats to life, or suspicious activity report, that's really what it is. And you've seen fusion centers when they began in 04 and 05 really were focused myopically on terrorism, specifically international terrorism. Today, they're all crime. You'll see them, you'll see them address all things. In fact, the state intelligence assessment on gangs that you directed that we produce annually is, is a product of the fusion center. And this way, we don't just have the DPS view of it. We've got the collective benefit of, of the information and expertise of all the agencies that know about gangs across the state. So that's the, it's a similar type of approach at other agencies. I can tell you, not all agencies, or not all fusion centers are 24 and 7, which well, means that we example, have to. For Del example, Dallas Fusion Center, I'm just looking at the first one on the yes, list here. Uh, how is that funded? Who owns it? Who operates it? Who deploys personnel to it? Who pays da for Dallas it? Police Department owns Dallas and operates Police? that way. Okay. Owns and operates, and they receive grant funding to support it not to pay for all of it, but support it. It's not 24 an hour and 7. The Collin County one just north of it, okay, is, is similar. It's, they, have, they do get grant funds for it, uh, but Collin County, you know, pays for personnel, dedicates personnel to it. Uh, Fort Worth just came on board. It's the latest one that the governor designated, and they, they, they are, it's the Fort Worth Police Department that's committing resources to that. So that's the Fort Worth Intelligence Exchange. Yes, sir. And the previous one you mentioned was the North Texas Fusion Center McKinney, correct? Yes, and that's a local entity that's funding funding that. It, it, well, it, I guess a, my first question would be if we're if we're looking at these fusion centers to be uh, kind of repositories, mm -hmm. if you will, of of um, intelligence gathering, then the idea that we're relying on uh, various funding through local entities to make sure they're properly staffed and, and maintained is something that, that we ought to be looking at. I mean, how, mm -hmm. how do we know, for example, that the North Texas Fusion Center in McKinney, Texas, has the proper personnel and staff to handle the responsibilities of that large region of Texas? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I can tell you that there's, I haven't talked to, to a Fusion Center director that says they have all the resources they need to do their job, especially those that are doing 24 and seven in that regard. That's why it's important. Well, I, I know that. I, yeah. I know where you're going to have conflicting yeah. ideas as to what level of government yeah. we need to have. Yeah. Uh, but but I guess if, if we are tasking these mm -hmm. fusion centers with developing this criteria and reporting these suspicious activity, then we need to make sure that they have the proper resources yes, to, do the, to the, do the tasks that we've given them. Yes, so uh, maybe offline, I know we're not prepared today to, to do that, but I think that's something the committee ought to look at is, as far as um, if we're relying upon this mechanism, get us where we need to be, then we need to make sure they're properly funded and, and staffed. So yes, I'd like to have the com committee be briefed on that. Any other things you'd like to 
No, I agree with you. Great. Okay. Mr. Chairman, okay. I, I was just wondering, uh, since we're going to some of these cities that happen to have fusion centers, would it be okay for us to... Absolutely. That's a great yeah. idea. Okay. That's <laughs> a great idea. Yeah. Okay. We at least uh, uh, part is perhaps invited testimony. Maybe we'll have an opportunity to tour yeah. those and, facilities. And, yeah. And here great. in Austin, at any time, uh, we welcome Sorry. it. And uh, we, we think, uh, of course... If you recognize intelligence is vital, and those that serve in the military understand <laughs> the importance of intelligence, and law enforcement understands it now. And so to the extent that uh, we can do it collectively and collaboratively, I can tell you this, Chairman, one of the things that we do, are, there is an expectation, is that, that we do work together, that we integrate, and in where some may be soft because they can't man a particular hour, we need to be able to cover that. And there's an expectation, or the governor has an expectation that we're that if a lead comes through, a threat comes through, that the Department of Public Safety works with their local partners to make sure just because a, th a, a fusion center is not operating that hour, we have to get that information to the local law enforcement. Okay, members, any questions? Chair okay. Murphy. Uh, the only, not really a question, but just more information that I wanted, um, and I know this may be difficult, but when you're talking about state involvement and federal involvement and who's doing what together. Is there any way that we could have some kind of flow chart that kind of shows and it, you may have it or you may not or may sure. be difficult and also a listing of the acronyms so we know what all of those are when you're talking about sure. them yeah. as we move on to the rest of the hearings because it seems to me like there's a lot of information mm -hmm. and it's a matter of getting the information to the right people not that maybe you need as much new information mm -hmm. on anyone but just take all that information and better be able to put it together and a lot of it may be funding and I think that's what we've talked about a lot it may be a funding issue but also a coordination issue but I think that would help all of us to kind of see how well, all this is moving together as we continue to move on to other hearings we'll put, we'll put a flow diagram together in terms of threats to life but also the terrorism uh, domestic yes. and international how they're investigated in Texas the JTTFs our joint terrorism task forces where they are and including the annexes and where we're proposing these threat assessments. That would be wonderful. Okay, right. Thank you. Mr. Thank Chair, you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. I'd like to add to that because, the, as they say, a picture sh sh states a thousand words. To that flow chart, is it possible to see how local law enforcement fits into that? Yes, ma'am. So that we they're, can see? Yes, ma'am. They're key, they're key to it. So, yes, okay. please. Yes. Thank you. Well, well, I think members of the committee, uh, thank you again for your testimony. Um, it's been very helpful. I think this starts a conversation. Um, obviously, these executive orders uh, have a, a time frame for implementation. I would hope that the department would continue to advise the committee yes, and, and its members as to the status of development of each one of these orders and, and how you, and when you're going to fulfill it. Uh, not only will it be important for this meeting, but in subsequent me meetings that we'll have throughout the fall. Uh, in the spring, so um, uh, continue the work, and then I would ad advise the members of the committee as you as you have ideas that have come up in the testimony, write them down, um, and and let's uh, let's start fleshing some of these ideas out. I think Chair Moody, you had a very good idea about the warrants, and so um, so let's uh, let's continue that process. But again, members, any other questions? If not. Thank you for your testimony. Oh, one more. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. If no further questions, we'll uh, allow the Colonel Scholar to be dismissed. And we'll, okay. we'll follow up with ATF as well. Okay. 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 Yes, Chair Moody. Um, no, I just kind of sense we're at a close, and I just want to thank you for for conducting this meeting in this way, and for you know for the the leadership you're giving us uh, here. I, it's important. Um, I've been a part of several conversations for years about gun safety and getting weapons out of the hands of folks that don't need to have them. I've had conversations with people in this room. Some of those conversations have been heated at times. Um, but there's one thing that, that um, the experience that we went through in El Paso gave me urgency. But our, that urgency isn't from a place of anger uh, or hatred or antagonism. It's from a place of love for my community and a place uh, of love for this state and making sure that we have the safest, most secure state we can 
Uh, and so I, I just I want to say thank you for this. This this is the conversation we need. Um, we can shout past each other, or we can talk to each other. And and the latter is the one that's going to give us the results that we need for a safer Texas. So I appreciate your well, leadership. Well, thank you. Sir. Thank you for all those kind of words. And members, I will tell you that uh, I'm greatly encouraged uh, by the expertise and the energy that each of the committee members have expressed today. Uh, I'm encouraged that as we move forward uh, throughout the state in this process that we will have this open and frank dialogue, that we will have this conversation. This conversation is not only important to the members of this committee, it's important to the state of Texas. They expect us. They expect their elected leaders to have this conversation. And I want to thank each one of you for agreeing to participate in this process. Uh, I think together we can advance this conversation and have this dialogue and move the state forward. And for that, I want to thank you. And if there's no further business, then uh, this, this, uh, the committee stands adjourned subject to call the chair. Thank you. <laughs>